I'm going to introduce myself. I'll tell you a little bit about what, we, what you're going to see today, and then I'll introduce you to uh, the better half over here. Well, not exactly my better half. Better half sitting there. But um, the anyway, <laughs> never mind. Um, the, the checks in the mail. My name is Larry Cristofero. I'm with EP, uh, uh, president of EPM Solution Partners. We're a partner, partnering firm in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Uh, but I tend to go pretty much all over the states and actually in the middle of closing a gig in Malta, if anybody knows where Malta is. So uh, the island south of Sicily. So we're all over the place. Um, Specializing in EPM solutions. Uh, a little bit about what you're gonna see today, what, what the goal of today is. Um, Sunflower Electric, how about we hit a... So sun, this is Sunflower Electric's journey from chaos to organize. Um, Sunflower Electric went from a capital budget of $2 million to a capital budget backlog of $350 million in about five years. Um, Corey's going to tell you a little bit about why and how that happened and uh, the challenges that were presented with um, Sunflower Electric to grow that kind of capital campaign and be able to fulfill those kind of projects in a short period of time. Corey's going to talk a little bit about people and process that uh, they ended up putting in place, starting with hiring this guy, which was a great idea. And, uh, and then I'm going to come in, I'm going to talk a little bit about some, uh, some demos, uh, about some with some key takeaways that uh, we did with Project Server. Um, realize this is a company that's uh, fairly young in their project management maturity uh, a few years ago. So uh, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about here is just some very basic things, but I'm gonna, we'll give you some key takeaways that are really important in any implementation. Uh, I'm gonna talk specifically, a couple of them, there'll be about five demos, a couple of them, uh, one was on the difference between SharePoint task list projects and enterprise projects. We stressed a lot about, um, you know, really how do we want to go because it is, it was really a, a fairly young organization from a PMO standpoint. So I'm going to actually talk a little bit about the differences between them. I don't think it's very common. Uh, people have seen them and kind of heard about SharePoint task lists. Any, all right, let me ask you that question. How many people kind of have heard within Project Server that there's a SharePoint SharePoint task list versus enterprise projects? Pretty much everybody. Anybody see or understand the difference in how they are implemented besides? Uh, um, Scott, sorry. <laughs> um, anybody really understand the difference? Good. Um, and then another uh, demo I'm gonna walk through is uh, the, necess the need for a poor man's portfolio poor man's resource capacity plan. And if anybody knows Project Server, they know that that's kind of the coup de grace of, of Project Server. You need high fidelity projects. You really need to be able to see and, and have everything really in place to really roll up resource capacity and demand. And um, that was one of the big challenges that uh, SharePoint, that uh, Sunflower had. And one of the big goals that they had to bring in Project Server, of course, they're talking to me, I'm like, hmm, yeah, sure, we can do that. Um, but we needed to provide that answer and we, we developed a good poor man's tool. Um, Corey doesn't like me calling it a poor man's tool, but. Um, That's okay, I had a limited budget, so I'm okay with it. <laughs> um, so without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce Corey Betts. He's the PMO manager for uh, that uh, Sunflower hired to be able to get their arms around this, uh, this um, endeavor around their uh, project management. And take it away, Corey. All right, thank you, Larry. I have, I come to Sunflower, I've only been there for about two and a half years now. I have a little bit of background in finance as well as some other project management at various other companies. So for Sunflower, not only was I a new employee, I was in a new position doing a new thing. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So this was a lot of fun. A challenge, I like a challenge, so that was a good thing. All right, so here's Sunflower. Let's talk a little bit about where we are. We're in Kansas, which is hence the name Sunflower. If you look at the map here, we're basically, we cover the, the western third of the state. We do have some assets that reach off into the east as well. We are a cooperative. We're a nonprofit. Basically, our, our goal is to keep our rates as low as possible while maintaining a reliable um, energy source. And we're made up of other member cooperatives. We do the generation and transmission. 
some of the slides later, you'll see the phrase GNT, which stands for Generation and Transmission. Then we sell it to our six members, or also our owners, and they do the distribution to the end user, which we have about 400,000 end meters at the end that we supply. So it's not just 400,000 homes, but it could be an airport, it could be one of the meters, it could be a hospital. The breakdown of how we generate our energy, basically half of it is natural gas, a third of it comes from coal, and the balance comes from whether it's wind, hydro, we also have some biomass generation as well. We are one of the, the largest interconnectors of wind in the United States. This is a really hard thing to say whether there's been times when we have been the largest interconnector of wind. And I don't know if you've ever been next to one of these wind energy units. These ants over here in the corner, also known as people, um, they just are dwarfed by the size of these. So not to give you a ton of numbers, but those are incredible. And this is in a little barn over here on the left. Your left, yes. Um, that's actually the length of a semi-tractor trailer. So just to give you a little bit of the scale of, what, of how big these are. Rhubarb Station, this is our first generation facility that we've constructed in 30 years. Which, when Larry was talking earlier, we went from about a $2 million capital budget, that's $1 million on transmission, $1 million on generation. This current facility is over $100 million construction. That's a pretty big jump. And two years ago, we did another project that was a $12 million project where we actually did an overfire air to help um, reduce some of our emissions. So after, it, it's a huge ramp up. Now we're actually going to have a decrease in construction as we come off of this because we're not going to continue to build $100 million generation facilities. This is also a landmark project for Caterpillar. It's the first time that they've been the, the they're going to put in the power plant or the engine for a facility like this. Wardzilla is not exactly happy with this. Is anyone from Wardzilla by any chance? Good thing. Um, so basically, it's, it, we are gonna have serial number one through 12 when we get done with this. So there's gonna be 12 reciprocating engines in our facility. Holcomb Expansion Project, you may have heard of us from that standpoint. Um, it's a, something we've been working on for basically a decade. Not to get into the politics or the, the policies behind it. It may happen, it may not but it's something from a project management standpoint that we have to be aware of. We have to be able to resource for it, have capital in place whenever we go to construct it. So it's just an extra layer of complexity that we have on top of everything else that we're doing. So that's a little bit about Sunflower. That's the 50,000 foot level. Now we're gonna get into some of the, the challenges, some of the people side of it. Some of this is very typical to project management. A lot of us have unplanned things that happened. For us, we have reliability in minus one, minus one. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Once again, the thing that we're trying to do is keep the lowest possible cost for our projects. Wind is intermittent. That's a challenge that we have to face. And because of that, we're actually exporting wind also. So that's been a big driver for our growth on the transmission side. And we're doing it with a limited resource pool, which probably sounds familiar to a lot of you because from a project management standpoint, we're all doing more with less, right? Oh yeah, change. Change is fun. People and processes are something that we need to keep in the back of our mind as we're putting all of this in, in place. And we started off by looking at what do we need to do from a process standpoint from improvement and bringing in the tools later. So when do you think about your electric utility company? Bill. I'm sorry, what's that? Bill. Oh, very good. I figured someone would say that. Lowest possible cost. I hear you. <laughs> oh, very good. So. You mean like that? I agree with you. Did someone here at Microsoft pay the electric bill? Okay, so unplanned events. Something happened to create that. This is one of our structures before. This is what it looks like after an ice storm. That line is obviously not going to be in service for a couple months. And a lot of times whenever our line crews are out there trying to fix it, they're doing it in the middle of that bad storm. When we're all huddled in our house trying to keep warm, they're out there trying to keep the lines from going down. And not only does the structure that's laying on the ground have to be replaced, but if you can look down the line, there's a lot of structures that are gonna have to be replaced. That line is gonna be out of service for a long time as well. Which goes into the reliability, the N minus one, minus one over here in the corner. So whenever one of these lines goes down from a storm, we need to be able to have backup way to get the energy to that home, to that hospital, to that airport, whatever the case may be. So we could have an ice storm that comes and takes out of a line, so we need to get energy around another direction to get to them. But what if a tornado comes along in the summer and takes out another path? We still need to be able to have reliability multiple different directions, which 
if you're trying to run, um, you're one of the ones trying to run your air conditioner in the middle of summer, that might be something you appreciate, I hope. The other reliability standpoint from a NERC and FERC, which we're not going to get into that, but it comes down to the SPP where we actually have to have backup or a 12% resource um, above what we actually have a load for, which is this little line here that you kind of see the dashed line and the solid line. What that is is if some, something happens, a catastrophic event happens at one of the major power plants, the surrounding utilities have enough extra capacity so that we can still keep the lights on. And so we're just kind of back up for each other. But once again, from a resource planning standpoint, on the energy side, that's something we have to build to. So we're overbuilding, which is an expensive thing, but we have to do it in order to stay inside of compliance. Lowest possible cost, like I said, when you write the bill, that was a really good answer. I really knew someone was going to say that. If you look over here in yellow, this is Sunflower. And comparing that to other GNTs, um, here in California, you guys pay about half again as much as we do for the same power. This really drives our economic development as well. And whenever we're trying to get businesses into Western Kansas by having a lower cost of energy than many other states or regions, it's an incredible way to help bring businesses to Kansas. And part of the reason whenever we went through this economic downturn recently, Western Kansas wasn't hit as hard as others because we were still doing a lot of expansion in the midst of the, whole, the downturn. But that's okay if you're in California. The New England states are more expensive than you are. So, yes, sir. Absolutely. That's I mentioned the GNT earlier. There is a GNT factor on this. This is this is how we're trying to compare it. We're looking at the generation and transmission side, not getting into the distribution because that's not something that we can control. That's our members, also our owners. It's a great point. And that's before the three hundred and fifty million dollars worth of capital. <laughs> <laughs> yes, kidding. which actually isn't in, impacting the rates too much because we're doing a ton of it through um, borrowing. It's a whole other story. And um, I do have a finance background, but I don't know if anyone wants to go into that, so we'll skip it. Um, so if we look at here, this top line, this blue line here, this is our load. It's a typical head and shoulders. Most electric utilities will have the same thing. If you look here at the bottom, this red line is the wind generation. You basically take and put an egg right in the middle. As our load increases, as temperatures rise and those high pressures come into western Kansas, the wind slows down. So then that means that the wind energy, the generation, is dropping when we need it the most. On the um, compliance side, they actually look at it that wind is non-dispatchable, which means we can't count it towards our actual capacity. And at the, our peak in July 27th, we had um, 1,147 megawatts was our load. The wind contribution to that was only four out of a possible 280. And on that, the wind in our system, our load, like I just said, our peak load was 1,147. We currently have 1,400 megawatts of wind generation on our system, which means there is more wind being generated, wind generation, than there is load on our system, which means we're exporting power. When they put these lines up about 50 years ago plus, that was never something that was actually thought about. The idea was is to have a local load serviced by a local generation facility. Now you're taking energy that were, is being generated in Kansas and it's being delivered to east, the eastern part of the United States, possibly Florida, the Carolinas, just depends on who it is that has the purchase power agreement to get that, that wind energy. And for a lot of things um, like 20% by 2020 and different things, a lot of States are needing wind generation for some of the, um, for their own green energy um, initiatives. And this is, they're having to get it from somewhere like Kansas where we have really windy days. And one of the um, cities that we have in um, Kansas, they have 350 days out of the year that they are considered a windy city, which means there's only 15 days that there could potentially not be wind being generated, which is an amazing geographic location for us to be. It has a lot of growth, but it also brings with it some challenges. I'm guessing it's bad on the hair. What's but that? it's really good for the wind. It bad is really on, good for the wind, yes. Bad on the hair. <laughs> yeah, 350 bad hair days a year. <laughs> okay. Right. So this slide kind of feeds into this. The wind potential in the state of Kansas, a third of it is currently already constructed. Now I'm using rounding, of course. A third of it is under construction, and another third is already in the planning stages. They're doing the contracts. They're doing all of that. So... And then that's just with our, the current um, tax credits and all that. If, if that environment changes a little bit, this number could increase, but that's just in the current 
where we're currently at, I guess. Oh, that's a fun one. <laughs> it, um, it could drive a lot of things. They're, they're currently debating what are the impacts of all the different um, bird situation. There's, there's two sides to every story, of course. And for us, um, we, we don't own the wind generation. We just do a purchase power off of it. And then we're connecting them to the elect bulk electric system. So it's, for us, it's all about the transmission lines that are connecting. But that is definitely a, there's a story there as well. Limited resource pool, we're all dealing with this. If you look over here on the left, 2007, you can go back farther, but for simplicity on the slide, this is transmission only. This does not include the generation that I talked about earlier, but you'd see a similar um, curve. $1 million a couple years ago, and within five years, we're gonna hit $117 million transmission capital. That's an incredible increase over a very short period of time. Now, a lot of that has been done with um, using contractors and consultants to do our construction, which is a great thing. It's, been allow it's allowed us to be able to do that, still hit as close as we possibly can the in-service dates that we're, re that we're um, being tasked with. But the important thing is, as we come down off of that peak, we're actually doing planning for projects that are in this 40 to $20 million time frame. Our internal resources, or our level of effort is gonna in exponentially increase. And it's gonna go from a low effort, and we get in over here, it's gonna increase dramatically because we're gonna be doing a lot of that work in-house when it comes to scheduling and projects instead of having it all be an outside consultant doing it for us. So we need to be putting processes and training in place now so that whenever we get to that, which is really right in front of us, then we're gonna be able to start building these projects, but we're gonna be doing a lot more in-house, which is gonna help save cost as well. Any questions at this point? I know we kind of threw, flew through that really fast. I'll get into the process here in just a second. But if you have any questions, just continue raising your hand. We'll, we'll address them as we go on. So now let's get into the solution. And for us, we basically divide our projects into run, grow, and transform. Our entire budget is roughly, with rounding, about $650 million, as Larry said earlier. About 300 to 350 million of that is our projects that are in the grow and transform space. And for us, whenever we talk about run, you, you guys have all used the cliche to keep the lights on. For us, run really means keep the lights on. So you guys are kind of stealing something from us, but that's okay. So this is a very simple slide. Just kidding. We're, not gonna, we're gonna unpack it in a little bit of detail here in just a second. But that's our change management process as a visual. One of the first things is the core teams. Now these are the group of people that are actually doing the work out there in the field. They're the implementers of the processor. They're actually the ones that are completing the projects and driving them through our structure development process we'll look at next. And we really look at things that we have three core teams here at Sunflower. We have, we're GNT, so generation and transmission. We also have the support side, which is the corporate. And for us to consider something cross-functional, it needs to be outside of that, let's use transmission as an example, it needs to be outside of that transmission bubble. And so if it's just metering and engineering, that doesn't mean it's necessarily cross-functional because we don't want to look at every project through our process. We just want to look at those that are really growing the business or changing the business. So we have a project approval committee. They're the ones that provide the governance. They ensure that we have a strategic fit and they determine the complexity. Now the complexity for us is whenever we look at something using a transmission line, that's just taking a line and connecting point A to point B and later, all we're changing is a point A and point B to point C and point D. So it's the same process in the middle for those type of projects in order to not become too bureaucratic and be as nimble as possible, and also to allow the people that are engineers to be doing engineering, not to be spending a lot of time doing administration. They're just gonna come in to the, through the process at the beginning to talk about and do the planning, then they're gonna come in again at the end to make sure we do that knowledge capture. What did we do right? What could we do differently if we were to do this again? And the, the uh, project approval committee for us is the CEO and the vice presidents. So this is a top-down approach. And then um, right underneath of that is the senior managers. So on our process, like I said, it's a multi-phrase process. And with scheduled updates using a resource management team, anything that's gonna come in to see the project approval committee needs to come through the resource management team to be evaluated first. And that's a cross-functional team using every budget area of our company. And we actually have sometimes one senior manager 
that represents five or six different budget areas. So I don't have 50 different, 51 different people in the room. I actually have eight of them that represent the entire company. And then we just have that discussion. This project is coming online, and the job of all the resource management team is they're, they're to ask questions, how does that project impact me and my teams? And then it starts that cross-functional discussion. Instead of doing the old way, where you just walk down the hall and say, well, I think, this, I think this impacts metering, so I'll go talk to them. I think this impacts this other group, so I'll go talk to them. And then later, you get halfway through the project, and whoops, we forgot to include environmental. We're doing some grading. We need to have some environmental. Well, if we're going to do that, we need a little bit more space. We're going to have some legal easements that we didn't address. And on and on, the next thing you know, your projects have increased 30%, which has happened to us. But by having these conversations early on during the process and having that cross-functional discussion, we bring that out at the very beginning before you kick off a project, saving us, in our case, millions of dollars and lots of headaches and actually allowing us to get the project done much quicker. Because, you know, project management 101, if you have an issue, the sooner you can address it and take care of it, the cheaper it's going to be on your project and the less it's going to impact your schedule. Prioritization, the way we have been doing this is we've been doing it through an Excel spreadsheet, just doing a high, medium, a low, using um, the different strategic initiative um, drivers that we have. So we have a line of sight from what we're doing to our um, strategic initiatives. And then it's just high, medium, and low, so we can quickly evaluate these, get an overall weighted average score, and then we can just stack rank all of our different projects. So if there is a resource constraint using this, we're able to know which projects needs to go be worked on first and which one needs to be either canceled, which has happened. The great thing about this is we started saying no. That's new for us. It's a really good thing to say no or to actually push a project off to a later date because of a constrained resource. Pipeline management. This is um, basically what, we, what I do, and now I have a, actually a department, so this is great. We were there to provide the training and engagement, talk about process orchestration and just the scheduling and making sure everything is working, and also do the program management, because we're looking at this from a portfolio level. Um, whenever my manager introduced me to the board, I'm the glorified cat herder at Sunflower. So some of the tools and techniques. A lot of that was processed. Now let's get into the tools. I think we're all here at a project convention, right? It's all about a tool. Level of effort, this is the tool that we use with the resource management team to basically come in and size up a project early on. And then at the first, when it first comes in, when we're first talking about a project, they, they basically can say four words. None, low, medium, or high. That's all really the options that they have. So we're doing a quick analysis on the project so we can evaluate several of these. And later on, just like a funnel on its side, as we go along in the process, we do planning, we do analysis, we realize a whole lot more about the scope, and we're starting to narrow that scope down and refine it. We come back, they'll come back in later and do an update. So then we can go in and do the same high, medium, low, or manual, and now you can put in, and this is exactly what that's going to cost for us. And we're looking at not only cost, but we're looking at internal labor hours, we're looking at outside contractor cost, and also uh, materials that we're going to be using. And it's allowing us just to do a roll-up. This is going to become a more sophisticated tool that we're going to move into Project Server as we become more, uh, as we you know, mature in this process overall. And then over here on the left, this is all of our different budget areas. So we're making sure that everyone's represented in this process. Project Server 2013, this is something that we've recently implemented. And Larry's going to do a really cool demo on this here in just a little bit, which I know this is the reason you're all here, right? To see a demo? And then also um, SharePoint 2013. This is something that we just recently installed as well. And while all of this is going on, we have another project going on that's information architecture where we're actually in information governance. We're taking 10 terabytes worth of information that's in our file drives all over the company, whether it's the F drive or the K drive or the Z drive, whatever. And we're actually putting some kind of governance around that and organizing it and bringing it into SharePoint. So now people are going to have one portal to get to the information instead of wherever they're used to getting it and whatever that mapped drive number is, which causes all kinds of silo effects where you can kind of squirrel away your knowledge. It needs to be somewhere everyone can access it. Absolutely. A big p records re is actually, or information management is the one that's doing that initiative. Our job was to bring in SharePoint 2013. It is, the container is built. Now they're bringing the information and putting it inside the container. And that's happening while I'm speaking here. So it's kind of fun to be awake. I don't know, is this recorded? I won't send her the link. Um, okay, so over here, this is basically a picture of what used to be our intranet. And we did that in SharePoint 07. 
And on the left, this is just a cultural thing. You'll find a lot of cultural things that you'll stumble across by accident. These are just two um, weatherchannel.com. And one site is our Holcomb facility I showed you earlier, which is where most of our employees are actually employed. And the other site is Hayes, which is the corporate building. But if you remember that first picture, I had all those other generation facilities around the outside and a lot of transmission facilities. Um, they're not represented here. That's not really a good thing. And then from the navigation standpoint, we have a duplication. You can navigate to anything across the left. You also have it across the top, which makes it a really wide image. It doesn't work so good whenever you're on a mobile device either. This is our new internet. And um, we'll talk, uh, Larry's going to talk about some quick wins. One of the things that we did was to have a contest to name the internet. Instead of just internet, we actually went through some fun where we had people submit names. And if you had a name that won through the voting by the, all the employees, then we would name it that, and you were going to get a prize. Whenever I brought this idea up to my manager, the first thing she did was look me in the eye and say, no, I am not giving away a day off. So we got her to give away a half a day off. <laughs> thought that was a pretty good uh, win for us. But if you hover over this button here, you can't really read it, but that says generation. If you were to hover over that, you get a fly out that gives you the different major departments inside of generation. Same thing for transmission, same, same thing for corporate. If we were to go ahead and get into some of the sites, you always have this nice little SunNet, or Sun, that was our winning um, name, was SunNet. If you click on that, you can always get back to the main page. And then we have announcements here. We have outlet news, any major news article, instead of sending out that monthly news. Well, as new items come up, we can just put it right here, and it's just a scrolling of all the different major events that are going on. And there's a lot of other things here, but I know this isn't a SharePoint convention. You guys have probably heard about SharePoint a little bit, maybe more than you thought you were going to. So I'm not going to get into it too much. The key thing, though, from this, not all departments are there. Like I was talking about, all the information architecture is still going on. So not all departments are actually living in SunNet yet. They will be here in the next two months. Um, very aggressive time schedule, the mere 10 terabytes worth of information, over 5 million different documents. But our email traffic has already dropped 30% just by putting this in, because a lot of things are happening now through the SunNet front page that were happening before through email. So how many of you would like to have your email drop by 30%? Th you think you could get a little bit more work done? This is some of the things that can happen when you have the right tools in place. Yes, sir? Are you guys going to like, switch over like, to We do have my site. We're talking about Yammer. Um, right now, the information architecture is primary objective that we have to get behind us. We have some other things that we're doing as well, but that's something we have talked about. And the My Sites is kind of where people are able to go in and, and play and have some of that social aspect as well, which is actually a huge cultural shift for us as well. OK, so some of the key contributions to date. I talked already about moving the bottlenecks to the beginning. That's something that was a really big impact for us. We have a process now to determine the level of effort. We showed you that tool a little bit ago. And then also to come in and reevaluate it. And Larry's going to go through. So those, that information that we've gathered, how do we use that in Project Server? Resource availability planning, Larry's going to demo that. And then it's a centralized um, place to get all your information across the organization instead of all those different drives. And it doesn't really matter for us whether it lives on a local drive, if it's a huge map or some kind of manual. It's all about how do you get to it. And, so, and it doesn't really matter who owns it. It's just can I find it? Can I search for it? And that's where really the SharePoint comes in. Yes, change is possible. And it's kind of scary at first, but once you get through, there's, a, there's some huge advantages to that. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Larry, and he's going to go into um, the actual um, demonstration as well. But is, before I do that, is there any questions? All right, you guys are making it easy on me. Oh, yes, there is one. Uh, what were the decisions to make? Yes, we're actually. Um, we, Larry's going to get into a little bit of the PWA and everything. We, we are hosted with Azure for our SharePoint as, as well as Project Server. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Um, <clears throat> No, that was actually a huge improvement to actually have a tool instead of the chaos was walking down, you know, going from door to door, trying to get that person's estimates to get an overall project cost. And, just try, and then also, now I've got a project cost. 
well, shoot, how do I get resources attached to it? I've got to go try to lobby to not only get money, financing, but I've also got to go lobby from someone else to have them actually work on my project. So by having a formal process, it's really helped us to organize it. And then, that, that's a lot of current tools, yes. And we're, we're looking at using Project Server to help to refine those to get a lot better. It's continual process improvement, but this was some baby steps to help with the process, get it rolling, so now we can actually implement through better tools. And, that, and that's a good point. So that's <coughs> help support the process. And one of the demos I've got is actually takes, takes now takes that low level of effort spreadsheet, which step one is to get the estimates and try to understand it. Step two is what do I do with all the data, right? And so how do I create a capacity demand plan around all of that data? That's what I'm going to show you. So that's one of the things from the observations that says, okay, that was one of their big challenges that we needed to make, we needed to solve. All right. <clears throat> All right. So, and um, so we're going to go through um, a few demos. Um, some demos. Some these are very simple demonstrations. They're not going to really teach you kind of how it's all been put together, but really kind of talk about some quick wins. That's really the key around here is some uh, key takeaways that we've been able to, to do with Project Server and how we've been able to do this. Remember that, this, that they were a very um, uh, simple um, project management shop five years ago, so there, we, we need to, we, you know, we, had, we have Project Server in place, we have lots of steps, we're still in the crawl, crawl phase, so if you've got, if you're just getting Project Server and you're just getting it up to speed, here's some quick wins that can really, that, uh, um, and some key takeaways that can help you in, in that uh, implementation. This isn't the big company, multi-divisional, you know, dashboard reporting kind of, kind of stuff. This is just some real good, simple, quick wins. So the first one is the intranet solution, okay? Now, Corey showed you this. You can't actually stole some of my uh, fire here. So you've got uh, directories, enterprise search, some help. These are all the ap applications. You've got all the different groups here. Um, here's your outlet news that, that kind of scrolls by, some quick links and some birthdays. Um, this is the stuff that really um, kind of helps that uh, we fir that were, was first developed. And it's not part of Project Server, but the key around this is that uh, the key here is really to, the key takeaway, I call it flies on flypaper, right? You need something to bring the people into the application. You need something that, that forces them to go in. Now, this isn't actually project server. Most people might, might uh, most implementations, you need to think of a compliance, timesheet entry, making sure people are coming in, on board. The whole internet solution was part of that process to get people on board. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about my sites and my tasks. Um, as, as another key that we've been able to latch on with the internet solution, but it was an important piece with, um, with our, our overall solution. The next is the, an outage tracker. Now, they track outages. Outages are, are a real key part, and they have to, they, they have to plan these outages several years out, out. They've got, um, it's, they have to submit to the FDA or FCC or. To the power pole, the SPP. Power, yeah, P more yeah, acronyms SPP. for you. It was a, a, some three letter acronym I, acronym I couldn't remember. It probably wasn't FDA, but anyway. <laughs> um, or F, FBA, FBI, I don't know. But um, there, it was an important piece. And one of the things that they ended up having to do was Coming back here, I feel like a DJ, you know? Zzz, 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 zzz. Um, so the way they used to do it was a spreadsheet, all right? The spreadsheet was 15 megabytes big, which I thought was like a huge spreadsheet until somebody told me there was a, they had a spreadsheet that was 150 mega, megabytes. Um, but this is their spreadsheet of outages that go on. 
Um, and when they're done with an outage, they just hide it. And they go through all of these different, um, you'll see that there's a, a little Gantt chart even, where they manually fill in spots where the start and end date of the outage is. Then they go, here's a, instructions on how to shade the legends within their spreadsheet, um, instructions on how to sort the data. They've got a, this calendar that goes all the way out that ends up taking the outages from one spot. If you look at the, from the first, um, first page to this page, and then it goes, um, it goes out in there manually putting these numbers in. I mean, these numbers aren't, oh, the, the numbers are some, um, I don't, I think they're the status at any, at every given day, right? And then they, and then out of that they create this, uh, it's all to automate this calendar, which has the location and the current status on a daily basis. And then they, put, they do a screen print, pull it out to a PDF, and they mail it out. It was a 15 megabyte spreadsheet. Well, Gotta be an easier way, right? <laughs> Gotta be. Gotta be an easier way. Well, go figure. Oops. Um, now I can't show you the actual outage, but guess what it looked like? A SharePoint list, all right? That's really all it was, was a SharePoint list. And everybody, anybody who knows SharePoint knows that a SharePoint list, you can have a calendar, all right? And with a couple of quick, you know, I concatenated the location with the status number, and sorry, I had to black out everything because, you know, they can't show anything. I built this in about a half an hour, and it replaced their spreadsheet. They're, they can bring in alerts and they can, uh, they can show everything they want. So it had nothing to do with Project Server, but it was an observation in the beginning. And now our, our um, crews out in the field can actually have this in their hand on their phone as well, which is pretty cool. That's something you couldn't do with a 15 megabyte file that we're emailing all over the place. All right. So the key takeaway here is find a quick win. Project Server's big. And, you know, there's one thing about a Big Bang Theory or, or in phases, but if you can find a quick win, it's going to be really important. It gets people in, in, um, that much more excited about what you can do. Now, SharePoint, the intranet project itself was very exciting, but within this project, we just, we, you know, simple observation said, hey, we got another quick win. It's really, uh, so another uh, important takeaway. The next step is really enterprise projects versus SharePoint task list projects. And so, it was a major piece, and, uh, and these guys, you know, we started this about a year ago, and there really wasn't a lot about SharePoint task lists. Uh, as you said, they were a very young organization around their project management process. And so, um, they're putting in an intranet. We thought, well, what about using SharePoint task lists? So the difference between, an, so an enterprise project, prior to 2013, anybody, anybody start with, and who's on 2013 today? 2010? All right. Those that are on 2013, did you start with 2010? No? Okay, good. Um, yeah. Prior to 2013, all you had were, was, were enterprise projects. Everything was an enterprise project. When you saved a project, it was saved in Project Server, and it was in the Project Server database. That's the only place you could have it. That's the only place you could work it. And in, with 2013, they came up with, they finally provided an option to use SharePoint task lists. It's called, um, it's a SharePoint la task list pro project with a visibility to, to project server. So you can actually manage your project using a SharePoint task list. You can take that SharePoint ta task list and you can integrate that, uh, sync that with a Microsoft project plan, which is, was made, also made a lot easier in 2013. The project plan is now saved to an assets data, an assets folder inside that ta uh, SharePoint site. So the whole syncing will, is real, much, much, uh, much better, much cleaner, and uh, um, very easy to do. And if you use SharePoint task lists, you've got all the, you got the functionality of SharePoint. You can modify it with a SharePoint task with with my task. I'm going to show you a little bit about it. And then you can just get the visibility of that task list with, within Project Server. So you can see 
really all of your enterprise projects that are saved to Project Server. You can see all of any projects that are uh, saved out there. I don't know that I would recommend mix and max, mix, mixing and mac, matching both um, unless you have multiple departments. But um, we originally thought, and, and it was really working fairly well from a uh, pilot standpoint where we were using SharePoint. We took advantage of the intranet project. We said we took advantage of the my sites and the whole idea around be, uh, the, the social uh, aspect that we wanted to incorporate with, with their intranet. So all of that worked out really well, um, but there was a couple of pockets that it really, that really needed uh, the power of Microsoft Project. And they, they had programs with master projects that you can't do with SharePoint Tesla. So we kind of worked out both, both sides. And we ended up, we landed on enterprise projects. But um, now I'm going to go back. I'm going to show you a little bit about what we did. So just to show you a little bit about the difference, because we really went through both. So if the, for an enterprise project, this is an enterprise project task list that's in the um, scheduling web part. So obviously, you can use Microsoft Project. You've got a scheduling web part. There were some nice advantages in Project Server 2013. With the scheduling web part, it gets improved each, uh, each version. Um, the nicest thing they did with this, uh, other than some baselining capabilities and some other things, is that they actually allowed you to key in duration and hours and to create a utilization. Before, in 2010, if you assigned a, a resource, it was eight hours a day from start to finish. And so they've, they've overcome that. You can't, exact, you can't actually go into the assignment record, but you can assign work at a uh, particular utilization when you're first going through it. I have another customer who is using the SharePoint task list, or, the, or this scheduling web part, as their entire, uh, as the only process, the only thing that they're using for managing projects in Project Server. So it really has come a long ways. It's still less than the Microsoft Project schedule, but there's so much you can do here that it's finally gotten to a point where you can actually manage a project. Using, a share, using this scheduling web part. Along with this, um, everybody's seen this, but everybody's seen it. Every, these are my, these are, um, these are, um, these are my tasks that come from an enterprise projects. Remember, everything's encapsulated with project server. When you have enterprise projects, everything's encapsulated in Project Server. So everything's going to the My Task Sheet within Project Server when you're using enterprise projects. All right? You do get visibility of those enterprise projects within um, SharePoint, but I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, if you can, for enterprise projects, for the associated SharePoint uh, site, those, these tasks are the same tasks that are in Project Server. So you have enterprise projects in Project Server. You have the tasks in Project Server that are modifiable. But the attached SharePoint site also has a task list that emulates the same task list as you see in, in Project Server. You'll notice up here it says this project can only be edited through Project Web App. All right? And if I click on edit, edit the project, it'll go back to the SharePoint task, to the scheduling web part. So it can only be edited in one place. It's an enterprise project. It can only be edited, edited through, through uh, Project Server. All right? But you got visibility of the entire project and all the tasks through, um, through SharePoint. So that's the key with enterprise projects. What we really tried to, tried to start out with was SharePoint task lists. So with, a share, with SharePoint task lists, um, this is a project 
that's using a SharePoint task list. It doesn't have the same functionality as the scheduling web part in Project Server. It's very basic, all right? You can do percent completes, uh, typically designed to select to uh, complete. Um, the nice part of using a SharePoint task list is that you have my tasks, which shows all the tasks, not only in SharePoint task list, but it does show your tasks in enterprise projects. So it will show tasks both from your enterprise projects and your SharePoint task list. The difference is you can't update the tasks for your enterprise projects. Enterprise projects are encapsulated in, in, in Project Server. All right, so if I try to update this task, it would, um, it thinks it, it closed it out, but it's really an enterprise project. Um, if I refresh, that task will actually come back. So you can't modify a task in your SharePoint task list that's an enterprise project, but you can certainly view it. And, you, and for any of the SharePoint task lists, now you've got full editing, you can start closing things out, you can, you can take care of anything you want within the SharePoint task list. So it's using my tasks, versus using the task sheet in Project Server. We really wanted to make use of my task. We wanted to take advantage of it. Um, it was important from a social uh, stickiness and using my sites and my tasks. Uh, it was just another uh, something we wanted to use. It was also very easy for with, with mobile devices, things like that. Um, this was almost a year ago. But um, the beauty, the nice thing that's happened is that and I've saw a lot within the last couple of days, is the apps that are available, all right? And that we didn't really take into account. We've got a lot of the same social capabilities, a lot of the same mobile ca capabilities showing everything that we see in enterprise projects on phones and tablets um, that we were looking for within SharePoint Task List. So I think we ended up making the right decision. We also now have uh, some very nice capabilities within Project Server for that. So, hmm? yes, you can. Let me can, let me complete it. So, the key around enterprise projects versus SharePoint task list, the key takeaway is really make sure you understand all your requirements. All right, make sure you drill. I mean, we needed to drill out to all the different areas. We had to go out into the field and uh, really kind of understand really what all the requirements were before we could really make a dis uh, an intelligent decision on that question. So for the, the ones that are not able to be updated from the task server, the task sheet, the different markers. Okay. Spinning. Do you find that people are frustrated that they can't, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I can update these times and I can make them go away, but I can't do my Um, good question. So the question was around frustration and usability around enterprise projects with, with my tasks. We don't use my tasks. Uh, the comment I made was, I wouldn't mix and match. I mean, you're either enterprise projects or you're SharePoint task list projects. Otherwise, you would, you would get very frustrated. You wouldn't know where to update. Because some things, some things would update in one place, some things update another. Now, if you had two, the beauty behind this, if you had two different departments, and one department was more mature, like IT, and you had another department that was on Project Server that wasn't as mature, like maybe marketing. I hope I'm not um, dissing anybody here. Um, marketing could use a completely different structure and update method than IT. But you have to be careful if you're sharing resources and all that. So, I mean, you really do need to be careful. Um, I would choose one or the other, personally. For an enterprise project, if I selected this? No, because it's in a task list. See, that's why I had like all Incredibly six. Incredibly response time. That's why I had six tabs up. <laughs> um, it's still thinking.
it takes you to it takes you to the project in a display task. It displays the task. Yeah. If you click on it, it takes you to the task from a display standpoint, and you can see further information. Uh, technically, you could, uh, if I had permit, if I had authority, I could, uh, I could go in here, and then you kind of get you you get away from where you are. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Remember yep. the maturity of the organization too, because getting they would have never waited, and then getting into this, where would they go? There's a lot of training involved, also. So, and we, originally we were wanting to drive to your point about social. We were wanting to drive everyone to the, your my site, so you could actually see it on your phone. What are everything I need to do? In one spot. But. Right. So, you want to see all your tasks? You can certainly display it, but. Where you see all your tasks is in, and really make uh, modifications. Pardon? <laughs> sure. Because the project plans in project server, so that's, it, you, you need to go back there. And the thing with the task list, and of course, I'm the bad downside is that I'm closing these. So the nice thing about here is you've got editing ability. This is this is the task in project server. These are the tasks that I'm seeing in PWA for enterprise projects. I now have grid editing where I can now update multiple tasks. So I mean, you really want to be able to be here. Um, versus here, um, but you still can you still can see them, and that's good. You still have you know important and important and upcoming. So you've got a, still got a lot of features that you can see from that uh, visibility, which works. Um, any other questions? It was very it was an interesting uh, sort of exercise for us to kind of walk through. Walk through that. Ugh. I really wish my PowerPoint was on the same machine. I'm kind of, okay, so the next one, collaborating with uh, engineering vendors. So as, as Corey was saying, most of the work was being done by vendors. And they'd have their big project that they were, that they were using. Sunflower also had internal teams that were managing their own, their own tasks that were integrated with the project. So what we ended up needing to do, and again, can't show you a real project. Oops, I can't even show you that project. <laughs> um, is, is just simply creating a quick, quick and dirty custom field that says, all right, I want to see just my engineering tasks. So I can, you, I can see my internal tasks, or I can see my consulting tasks. And we actually went uh, one step further, just to let you know what we ended up doing is we talked to our consulting firms. They brought in their, their big project, their three, 400 line project. And then they also brought a project, they also brought on a monthly basis, they'll, they'll update just the key milestones that drive Sunflower's tasks. So it's these tasks here, well, there's only one, but it's these tasks here, the key milestones that they're providing in their small plan that we update in the, in the schedule, and then we take those key milestones and we, uh, that helps us driving, that helps us to drive the tasks that, that we have to do internally. Does that make sense? Questions? Bless you. Um, there was also a couple of different ways that we uh, worked with these uh, master projects. So in transmission, they were very big projects. They outsourced everything to the consultant. 
So the vendor managed the entire project. Sunflower uh, just provided most of the approvals and some of the internal uh, coordination. Um, so the updates were the key milestones, as I said, um, and the Sunflower activities, and then Sunflower updated them in Project Server. Engineering worked a little bit different. Uh, they had fewer projects, and they had a couple of good project managers. So Sunflower was still managing those projects, supported by multiple vendors who were doing some of the work. So each vendor provided their initial schedule, and they created a, a master project that uh, um, sort of brought all those schedules in. So, he, so what we would do is say, okay, here's, a, here's some work I want you to do. Build a plan. We incorporate it into this project. It's not a real master project. We just incorporated the, the tasks, and then we managed the entire project um, using the same concept of the uh, custom field. So we knew which were the vendor tasks and which were our tasks. We knew what we're updating and when, the, when we were talking to each of the vendors. Um, we knew, you know, we could have their schedule up versus the entire schedule. So it's, just a, it's, a, it's an ability to filter. Simple solution, instead of master projects and sub-projects and external links, was a much simpler solution just to be able to filter those, uh, um, to be able to filter tasks, be able to, to pick those tasks within a project plan. Key takeaway is just be creative and find a solution. We needed something simple. Um, and having a nice little project plan that, that uh, allowed us to group, and, uh, group tasks based on the source of the task was a much better solution. Lastly, and my personal favorite, is uh, this simple portfolio resource plan. So as I talked uh, earlier, one of Sunflower's key needs, what drove the purchase and expense of Project Server was the promise, not by me, the promise the, of resource availability and resource demand and, and capacity management. And of course I said, sure it can be done, right? Um, but not phase one. And Corey's like, oh, um, okay. But I need it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, but it came evident they needed something, right? And so we developed a before I get there though. When you think of a poor man's tool for doing resource demand, what do you think of? Excel, right? Bunch of projects, right? Here's all the resources. And if, you, if you're moving projects around, you want to see time, time phase, right? What do you do? You create a sheet for each project with all the resources and time, and you kind of roll them up, and you, right? People who were really good with Excel would kind of walk through all that. I sit there and shake my head. I'm like, you have projects, you've got resources, you need to schedule. Don't think, don't think Excel, think project, right? That's Microsoft Project. You can't do that in Excel. Well, you can if you force it, right? And every project needing to kind of work through that. It's really Microsoft Project. Nope. So we developed a poor man's tool. And I laugh at Corey every time I call it that. So here's our project pipeline, all right? Start, finish, duration, work, and resource names. Those resource names are the same budget areas that were in that LOE worksheet, that Excel spreadsheet where they estimated, all right? We said, we got to do something with this, with this spreadsheet of all these hours and all these projects, all right? So you put it in here. This is different. This is double entry from Project Server, granted. All right? Any Excel spreadsheet would if you had Project Server. Um, but it's strictly for resource demand. They've already prioritized their project, right? And they'll soon prioritize their project using, a, using the selection, criteria, selection prioritization within Project Server. They've got, they've got um, drivers, all right? They're, they're ripe for doing that. Probably a, a solution that'll come, come soon. But to get real resource demand and estimates, 
Um, they're going to use this until they're ready. So here's all, this, here's all the tasks. Um, and each task has all of the different, as you can see, all the different budget areas that are part of those, uh, those projects. I'm doing a little bit of cheat sheet here. So here's a list of all of the budget areas, grouped by area, technology services, generation, transmission, and their current capacities based on, based on the capacity of doing PAC projects, all right? Not run. Um, so it's the number of people, full-time equivalents, that, are, uh, that are, will be available to do PAC projects. Now, for each project and each resource, here was the key. We asked for one more piece of information than that Excel spreadsheet, or than that from an, uh, a spreadsheet. Um, we didn't ask for hours per month, but we wanted contour. Anybody understand, there's a, who has, uh, knows about the contour feature in Microsoft Project? A couple. A little, it's a little less known feature, but you can do a work contour. And I never recommend it in a regular project plan. Uh, Microsoft Project's complicated already. Trying to teach people contour doesn't really work. But you can have it flat, backloaded, frontloaded, double peak, early peak, late peak. Bell and turtle. What's the difference between a bell and a turtle? <laughs> a bell is like really big in the middle, and a turtle's not quite so big in the middle. But you know, um, it's a way of of saying how how should my work go across this time layer? But it works great for an entire project. All right, they may not be able to. They they're they're saying I've got hundreds of hours that I'm applying to the to this project over the course of could be multiple years. Um, they're not going to want to lay them out on an hourly basis, but they, they may know that they're going to be front-loaded or double bell. So they give us the number of hours, and they give us one more thing, is, which is which, what's, what's the contour. That drives the resource plan. This is a quarterly resource plan with the hours based on uh, where they're going. We've got a, we've got a timeline. I pulled the timeline from the top of the Gantt chart and just created a separate sheet. And we've got a resource graph by budget area. All right. So now I can see if I want to look at one, um, if I want to look at, say, a couple of different groups. I can see all of the groups in uh, transmission whoops, combined into one, uh, one graph. So I can look at one, one group or multiple groups, and I can see uh, graphically what months are overloaded. Yeah, we won't talk about that. Um, oops. And then the resource, the utilization by area, which is really sim uh, a simple, uh, simple graph talks about percent allocation with a percent allocation. So there's some, there's some tricks around setting up the views to get this thing uh, put together. Percent allocation is something that you can, that is possible if you want to use detail styles. And you can include percent allocation, which gives you all of this. So this is percent allocation over a quarterly basis based on the capacity of the resource pool that you're tapping into for working with um, um, PAC projects. And you can go quarters. You can view months, all right? Now, now I've got, I've got all, all the capabilities there. All the data is there on a daily basis. I've got, I can view pretty much anything and everything I want to, I want to see. Any questions? Yes.
When you say group by work stream, meaning? Can you, t so you want it alphabetically by work stream? So th this is the group, information systems. These are all the projects and all the, re and all the uh, demand for those projects. So I can now see where my, where my demand is coming from. All right. So I'm getting really good information from two pieces. As long as I have an estimated start and date, I need number of hours and contour, and I've got the ability to, to really see. I have all this information at my fingertips. For each project, for each project, so for each project, they're providing for each project and for each budget area, they're saying for this project, information systems is going to need, th uh, well, not 15 hours, but 15,000 hours. But for this project, an information system, and in information systems. When we were doing the Project Dodge City, I need 13,000 hours at a, it looked like a flat allocation across um, the entire project. So the For each project, they have a spreadsheet that says, so for that project, these are all of the, the business, the budget areas that are required to do work for that project and the number of hours. And the real spreadsheet that we're, the real sheet that we're looking at is the, uh, uh, is this. So that's, project and budget area. This is the data entry worksheet, really. This is the project budget area. And they're saying for this project, these are the budget areas that are needed. This is the amount of work and how it's contoured across the duration of that project. Can I explain that in project server? Is that all done offline? This is all done offline. This is all a separate Microsoft project schedule that the PMO keeps as they're getting information about these uh, initial projects so that they can do their project planning. So I've got, like, when you guys were doing, we showed your process earlier. It's kind of your initial triage where you moved every, the hard work was modeled like front to front. Right. This is what you're filling out now. Right. So they'll prioritize their projects, um, soon prioritize their projects in Project Server, currently prioritizing their project um, using their current process, and using, uh, soon they'll be using drivers, strategic drivers, prioritiz prioritization and selection of the cost, so they'll have a, a prioritized list of projects, um, and then eventually this would move into project server, but the next step is, okay, I've got my priority of projects, how do I need, um, how am I gonna lay that out? To meet that also meets the um, util uh, utilization of each group, or do I need to hire more people, or I need you know, so we start prioritizing start dates and and work through all of that um, within this tool. And prioritizing the start dates was a really important thing for us because before it was just everything needed to start, and we had way too many projects going on like all the time. I don't know if that sounds familiar to anyone else, but. I got this when they, when they started the 2014 plan. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> and I've had to, uh, I had to change names to protect the innocent, of course. Uh, what am I doing here? Um, anything else? Any other questions? Um, shoot me an email, I'll be happy to, yeah. 
And this works, and again, the caveat is this works for Sunflower, you know, and there's specific views. Nothing's customized, but it's very configured to what their needs are. Um, but yes, I can give you uh, lots of information. Uh, there's actually a little job aid as to how to, how to go, how to manage projects in this. So job aid will help you out too. All right. And the key takeaway here is concentrate on the key objectives. All right, that was their primary objective. And for a while, we kind of said, yep, we're going to get there, we're going to get there, but I was getting really. nervous. <laughs> <laughs> he had hit me on the head only three times before we said, hey, you know, we really need to help you out. And we sat and thought about it, and it was actually a pretty simple solution. And will work really well. So key takeaways, flies on wallpaper. Make sure it's sticky, right? Make sure people are coming to your uh, solution. There's a lot of key, uh, keys to making to success. But some of them we're, we've, uh, we're trying to communicate today, flies to wallpaper, find a quick win. Get people excited. Understand your requirements. Make sure you understand all of your requirements and you, to build the best system that you can. Some of them might be hard to, some of them might require a bit of detail. And not every organization is the same. Not every organization, not gathering requirements isn't the same in any two organizations. Be creative, all right? They're telling you what they need, right? There are solutions. This is a tool with lots of features, and it's a matter of using those features to meet the needs of the, of the organization. Be creative, and you can make Project Server do pretty much anything. And if not, in, that ca in this case, <laughs> Microsoft Project can, all right? There's ways of doing it. And if that can't, SharePoint can do it. Right? There's just a lot of ways that we can do it. Our quick win was a SharePoint win. Um, concentrate on key challenges, key objectives. Um, we, we were able to solve that. So, I think this is yours? Uh, we've pretty much talked about a lot of these here. Uh, reporting and drafting, dashboarding, that's something that's up um, for us coming in the near future. <laughs> and tra training, uh, there's a lot of training that needs to go into these tools where we have a, a plan in place, which we won't go into. And scheduling for run projects, a big key for us as we talked about that portfolio, we're looking at those grow and transform projects. Had several requests from some of the business units that are saying, hey, um, everything I do is run, but this is a pretty cool thing you're doing for these other guys. Can I be a part of it too? That's an incredible win on the culture side to have people asking to be a part of a project. Usually they're trying to run from us. It's kind of nice to have them coming to us. And there's gonna be some continued process improvements. We talked about a few of those. And there's several things from the automation space we're looking at as well. And it's, it's all about what we can do a lot of really cool things, but what are you going to do with that data? Are you actually going to make business decisions on it? So there's a lot of things that you could do, but that doesn't mean you need to do all of them. Try to keep it simple. All right, so I went through that really fast. Any other questions? Because to get you out of here, I don't have a lot of time left to get you out of here early. So. Any other questions? If not, we'll be around, we'll be at the party. Um, we were the warm-up act for the party. So all right, thank you very much. Thank you.